all right then we have the uh announcements here coming up the budget meeting is coming up and then on the fourth sunday the fourth is our church anniversary there's no evening service that night because it's the first sunday of the month there'll also be a potluck dinner that day and uh, my brother tim and his family and my mom will be here yay <laughs> but they'll be here playing some guitar stuff and that kind of a thing and then helps missions on the 11th and the 14th so uh, that's coming up in the near future here but we're going to pick up tonight where we left off and uh, we took into consideration last time we were here uh, before our vacation before chris and i were gone uh, Psalm 3 and 4, where David put his confidence, his trust, his well-being, his emotions, his expectations, and his destiny in God's hands. And he acknowledged, he understood, he knew, he realized, he recognized, and he proclaimed his reliance on God. Those are things, if you want to take a look at those, you can uh, get to e the, uh, view them on the uh, uh, YouTube, or you can get the notes from me. But we're going to pick up today in Psalm chapter 5, or the fifth psalm. Remember, the psalms are songs... And this is the fifth song in the song book, as it were, to be done on the kneeloth, on the flute. Okay, David wrote this, <clears throat> and he gave it to uh, his chief musician, say, accompany this song on the flute. All right, so we see here, David sought God's guidance, God's heart. What is it? David wanted to be in tune with God. So he said, give ear to my word, O Lord, consider my meditation, hearken to the voice of my cry, my king and my God, for unto thee will I pray. So David knew who to ask. And that's some of the things that we have to look at frequently in our lives is we ask advice from this person or that. And there's nothing wrong or evil about asking advice. But understand this. The Bible tells us, if any man lack wisdom, if any of you, are, if any of you can't figure out it, God says, ask me. I'll tell you the answer. Now, as pastor here, uh, <clears throat> I, I went to Bible college and, and I taught school for a number of years and and uh, I study my Bible and all that kind of thing. And, and I want to be able to help you. And if you've got a question, feel free to come ask me. But, but don't rest in, a, in some kind of illusion that I've got the answers. I might. But who, who does have the answer? God does. And one of the first things I ask people when they come to me with a, with a spiritual religious question is, have you asked God yet? Well, why are you coming to me? If you haven't asked God yet, ask God. I remember when I was in college, one of my professors uh, was talking about when you're preparing a message, when you're preparing your sermon, you ought to go to at least three commentaries and look it up and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. But I raised my hand and I asked the question. I said, well, before I go to any of the commentaries in the in the, in the uh of the, the prospect of not reinventing the wheel. I know we're not supposed to reinvent the wheel. We've got told that a lot. But before I look at any commentaries, shouldn't I ask God? Maybe God wants me to reinvent the wheel here. Not that it's new. When I'm all done with the wheel, it's a wheel that looks just like Spurgeon's wheel. But won't I have learned more in digging it out and looking it up and studying it through than I would have just going to Luther to get what, what he said. Now I'm just going to preach what Luther said. There's nothing wrong with going to anybody and getting their opinion. But understand, David said, I'm coming to you, God. You've got the answer. So David sought after God's heart. Look what he says in verse 4. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. I know that what you tell me will be right. So I'm coming to you. If I go to a guy, it's like uh, if you're conservative or liberal, if you're, listening, if you're watching CNN or Fox, I don't care. Understand. The conservatives and the liberals, they will all put their spin on something. None of what they tell you is 100% the gospel truth. It may be closer to the truth than the other guy. It may not be, but it's all going to have its spin. Who gives you the truth without the spin? God. So go to God. Then David not only sought God's heart, he knew what God's character was. Look what he says. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest the workers of iniquity. You'll destroy them that speak in leasing. That's forwardness. Uh, falsely, they're, they're trying to gain something. They're telling you what you want to hear to gain something out of it. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. God, David said, I know, what you, I know what your character is, God. You are total truth. You hate falsehood. 
Now, as for me, David desired communion with God. He said, as for me, I will come to thy throne in the multitude of thy mercies, and in thy fear will I worship toward the holy temple. I'm coming to you on your grounds, on your conditions. Listen, fellowship with God is conditional. God will not, he won't go to the pig pen and jump in with the prodigal son. The day the prodigal son came to himself and got out, the father met him. The father did not climb into the pig pen with him. God says, you want to have fellowship with me? I'm over here. This is where I am. I'll fellowship with you when you come to me. I will not come to you in your... I'll call you while you're in your sin. I'll call you when you're in your falsehood. I'll call you when you're in your folly. But I will not go there. When you climb out of the pig pen and start coming back, I'll come to you. Okay? David desired God's communion. So what did David do? He said, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to your house on your conditions. And you can go back in the Old Testament for an example of this. David wasn't a priest, so he couldn't come in the priestly mood uh, or, 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 or uh, way, method. But the priest, when they wanted to come to God, they had to do a certain mitvah ritual washing. They had to wear certain clothes. They had to come on certain days. They couldn't just do it the way they wanted. Okay? So David said, I'm coming to you. David wanted God's communion. When we have our communion, our, our Lord's Supper services, the Bible says, there are those who are coming falsely. We're here to show that we're in communion with God. So examine yourself. Make sure you're right with God. Don't, don't, well, you know, what would Jesus do? We wear those little bracelets, have the bumper sticker on our car and all that kind of stuff. What would Jesus do? We ask the question, what would Jesus do? Do we really ever expect to answer it? Just because you're a Christian, just because you're a child of God, just because you have a Bible, and oh, it's a King James, and it, just because you come to church and you tithe, doesn't mean that what you do is what Jesus would do. Now, he'd come to church and he'd fellowship and he'd support the ministry, but we, we tend to look at that and say, well, that, that covers everything else I think, do, and say. No, 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 no. What would Jesus do about buying your milk at the grocery store? Would he tell you to go to Publix, or would he tell you to go to Sweet Bay, or would he tell you to go to Costco? Where, where, where would he tell you to go? What would Jesus do? I'm going to buy my gas at the Valari or the, or the racetrack. Or what, what, what would Jesus do? So, well, you're, you're being silly. No, no, no. God has a will, a purpose, and a design for everything you do. So before you go buy gas at the Shell station or the Sunoco station, ask, oh, God, where do you want me to go get the gas today? You're going to go buy milk? Should I go down to, to Sweet Bay or should I go, go to Costco? Should I go to Publix? Where should I go today, Lord? Ask God what he wants in every aspect of your life. David then continues in verse 8. David ensued God's correctness. David ensued it. He was chasing it. The word ensue means to chase till you get it. He ensued on God's correctness. I'm going to go get God's correctness. I'm going to chase it down until I get a hold of it. He was after God's heart. He wasn't a man patterned after God's heart. He was a man after it. He was seeking it. Okay? He said, lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. I've got enemies, and my enemies are putting situations around. I'm now in a circumstance that I would rather not be in, and if I don't rely on your correctness and your righteousness and your justice... I'll do things the way I thought I should do it. I tried to figure it out. I tried to get me out of this mess. Lord, you lead me according to your righteousness. Make my way straight before your face. Don't let me try to figure it out myself and think I'm doing it right. I'm getting out of this mess the way you want when I'm really doing it the way I want. There are times, as a, as a person, who, I, I coach a lot of teams, uh, different sports and so forth, there were times, hey, listen, as, as a player on the team that I was coaching, you'd have done it differently. But I was putting you through something because I knew what was ahead. I'm not going to make practices easy. I want the wrestling mat. When you step out on that wrestling mat, I want you to think, man, this is, this is the easy part. Going through practice is hard. Being trained is hard. Lord, you lead me in what you know I need. Put the, put the illustration together. Help me learn what I need to learn so that my path is straight. I don't look at the enemy 
and I let them determine what's going on. Okay? He goes on down in verse 9. David re rejected man's incorrectness. Not only did he ensue the correctness of God, he looked at man and said, I reject the way they do things. There is no faithfulness in, in their mouth. Their inward parts are very sickness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongues. They're going to say whatever they can. They got to say to get what they want. There's nothing honest or true about them. As I mentioned before, somebody may be more correct more often or less correct more often, but the media, don't trust anything they say. Check it out. Read it. Find it out. Just listen to it various reports at different times and they'll they'll interview a person and the person says blah 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 and then the report will turn and say and so you see and he says the complete opposite fred said well, no that's not it at all we just heard what fred said now you're telling us that fred actually meant something different fred said yes i went swimming yesterday and the water was cold so you see fred is all about global warming and thinks that we ought it's not at all what he said and it goes the other direction. Listen to what people say and then listen to what people say about what was said. You must check it out. You must check it out. David rejected the incorrectness of mankind. Getting close to the end here uh, of this psalm. David expected God to be just. David says, listen, I know when it's all said and done, God, you're going to do it. And what you do is just. Now, please bear, bear with me here. Our definition of justice and fairness and equity let's be honest it's well to be really to, if you want to really be fair and just and equitable you have to do it the way i want because i am a fair just equitable person i've never heard anybody get exactly what they wanted and then look at the person that gave it to them and say you know that's not fair but what is we argue about fairness when we're not getting our way David said, I know that God is fair, God is equitable, God is just. Do it your way, God. How I feel about it isn't the point. Look what it says. Destroy them, O God, lest they fall, or let them fall uh, by their counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. Lord, they're counseling against what is right and correct and good and fair and just. Let them follow that and fall off the deep end. Don't save them. Don't spare them in their rebellion. Let them follow their own track. They'll fall off the end. But let all those that trust you rejoice. Let them that trust you shout for joy. Why? Because you defend them. What's it say there? But let all those that put their trust in you, let all them shout for joy. You defend them. Let them also that love thy name be full of joy in you. Don't let them just be happy about the end result. Let them be happy, let them be joyful in you. Let them be joyful knowing that it was you that defended them. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will compass him as with a shield. You will take care of them. You will defend those that are trusting you and trying to do the right thing. All right, that's the end of Psalm 5. Now Psalm 6, David writes to the chief musician. He says, you ought to play this one on a stringed instrument, on a harp probably. So David then begged for God's patience and God's mercy. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Lord, there are times I do things and I know it really, really upsets you. Don't punish me or chasten me at that time. Let me give you a little, as, as parents, let, let me give you a little uh, application to this. You can agree with me or not. This is just my opinion for whatever it's worth. Your children will sometimes do. I have nine kids. There are times my kids did things that really upset me. Don't exact punishment, discipline, whatever you, term you want to give it. Don't exact that on your child when you're upset. Tell the child to go sit down, go to the room, whatever, and you personally calm down so that you can deal in a disciplinary, corrective way with your child. And your child does just, they're not just seeing, dad's mad. I've spanked my children before. I've never spanked them in anger. 
I'll go to my children. I'll say, we talked about this a week ago, whatever it was. If you do X, this is what will happen. You do X, Y is what will happen. Remember that discussion? Yeah. Did you do X? Yes. Okay, so do I lie? No. I try my best not to lie. So when you did X, Y is going to happen. Correct? We talked about that. Okay? What is the Y? I get three swaths. Okay, you're not going to get two. You're not going to get four. You're going to get three. Whack, whack, whack. Hard enough to hurt, to bring, bring pain. Now, we're all done with that. Okay? If you do X again, you'll get five swats. Did the, did the three hurt? Yeah, okay. Do you want to get five? No. Then don't do X. It's a cause and effect thing. Now, let, let, let's discuss, if you want right now, let's discuss why you shouldn't do the X. Let's learn. And let's go down to Dairy Queen and have a, have a popsicle or whatever. You can't do X because this is the bad stuff that happens when you do X. And if you do X, you'll get three swats. Next time, you'll get five swats. Okay, if this happens again, really upset me. I'm not mad now. Now it's just, we got to deal with the situation. You did X, you got to get Y, and Y is five swats this time. Next time will be seven or nine, whatever it is. Do you want that? Lord, don't deal with me when you're really upset with me. Have mercy upon me. Have patience with me. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. Lord, heal me. My bones are vexed. My soul is vexed. But thou, Lord, how long will you give me? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul, save me for thy mercy's sake. The Bible tells us this in one, one, of, the, one of the writings. It says, he, God, doth know that we are dust. He knows we're not there yet. He, God knows we're not in our glorified bodies. God knows that we're not perfect. God knows that we're weak. So David says, I'm nothing. Please, Please have patience with me. David never said, I'm weak, so let's just forget about this one. And he says, no, you can rebuke me, but, but can it be merciful? I'm begging your mercy. I'm begging for your patience. Okay? He goes on here. This is the last part of this one, of this psalm. It's real, real short. David trusted God's plan. David said, I know when it's all said and done, your plan is what's going to get done. So let's, let's talk about your plan for a second. I mess up. Deal with me in patience and mercy. But let's look here. In death, there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? Don't, Lord, I'm deserving of death. But if I'm dead, I can't praise you. So have patience with me. Correct me. Bring to me a new, into a new position. Help me with my heart's attitude. Help me do right because I want to give you praise. I am weary of my groaning. All the night I make my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. I am really sorrowful over this. Uh, mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxes old because of my enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. The Lord hath heard my voice. He now changes the direction of, it, of, his, of this song. And he says, okay, I've been talking to God in this song so far. But now, I'm you guys, you my enemies, God heard me. I trust God's plan. God says, hey, ask me. I'll help you. You know a problem? Come to me. I'll take care of it. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. David now changes as he says, I trust God's plan. I know he heard me. And all of you who have been afflicting me, all of you who have been persecuting me, you'll be ashamed. Now, in the context of all this, the timing of all this, who was the enemy that he's basically talking about? King Saul, trying to kill him. And God had already told King Saul, David will be the king. God had told David, David, you will be the king. But David wasn't going to be the king for several years. So in God's professed prophecy of David, you will be king, and David and Saul both knew it, David wasn't king yet. He had to endure the testings that Saul was going to throw at him until God said, now is the time. Because God was 
trying to give, I say, shouldn't say trying, God was giving Saul ample opportunity to repent and confess and do right. And Saul wouldn't. And so when Saul had finally crossed the line of no return, as it were, God said, okay, you're done. But up till then, you always could have been okay. I could have forgiven you on this. Still would if you confess, but you, you won't. I will not protect you anymore. So Paul, uh, Saul goes up to a Mount Gilboa and fight against the Philistines and gets killed. God says, I won't protect you anymore. All right. Well, that's the end. Is there any questions about that? Okay, seeing none, we'll stop and uh, we'll have a word of prayer and take the offering and all that kind of stuff. And next Wednesday, we'll take a look at the next two Psalms, Psalm 7 and 8. All right, let's pray.